Good morning and welcome. How's your morning so far? Anybody come, come uh, discombobulated? Uh, it's kind of been that way for me this morning. It's time to just settle our hearts and prepare to enter into the worship of the living God. Um, I've been thinking a lot this week about a young family connected to our congregation, uh, uh, Chris and Lauren Kasman. Uh, they've uh, received very devastating uh, news about Chris's health. Uh, he's been placed into hospice care. And uh, so it's a couple with a young family of, of four children, and uh, it's heartbreaking. And I was thinking about that in the context of what that causes us to, to do and how it causes us to respond. Because I think it takes us to that place where we wonder, why God? Why would you let this happen? And that's a hard place to be. And I think we've all been there at one point in time in our lives. And I was thinking about that in the context of being a church family, uh, being a body of believers that cares for one another. And so I thought it would be important for us this morning uh, to take a moment and lift Chris before God in prayer as a family. So I would invite you, if you would, would you stand with me? And let's go to the Lord in prayer about this circumstance. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we live in the truth that you are sovereign. We live in the truth that you are a God of love. We also live in the truth uh, that you have the best things in mind for us eternally. And some of the events of our lives uh, cause us to question, to wonder, to consider events like this and ask that question, why God? But I would pray today, God, that you would open our hearts to, to understand your wisdom, to understand your perfect plan, <coughs> to hold tight to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And although we pray for healing God, we also submit to sovereignty. We pray for peace that transcends all understanding in the, in the context of this horrific thing that, that's happening in Chris's body and in his life. But we know, God, that you hold him in your hands. And so, God, we would pray comfort over that circumstance. We'd pray wisdom for how it's responded to medically, but more than that, we would pray your presence with him. We pray over his family, his young family, his wife, his parents, all those who are, are beginning the process of grieving this terrible thing, that you would surround them with your agape love. Help us as a community of faith, God, to continue to uphold them before your throne of grace and prayer. Display your love in this time, we pray. Display your sovereignty. Display your hope. Bring peace, God, where there should be just turmoil, 
settle upon the hearts of your people and all those who are journeying with Chris and his wife and his young family, and his parents and all who love him. May your peace abound. For we pray in Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's a firm foundation. Let's stand and see how firm it is. with us and trust that our time together will be a real time of worship and praise to the Lord. <coughs> Just one announcement and that is a reminder that the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church of Canada is meeting this week, actually starting today. <coughs> this is the body that meets once a year and where all the major decisions and discussions take place. So we would really appreciate your prayers for this group as they meet this week. The writer of Psalm 96 begins his psalm with these words. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. 
please stand with me now as we as we join together in singing as Joel and uh, leads us in songs of praise. Then.
Hi, it's Pastor Wardell with another children's message for you. And today I've got a special guest presenter. It's Soren, my baby boy. He's about three weeks old. He's an infant still, a little baby. And you know, that means that he is not very strong. He's very cute, but he's not very strong. One of the first muscles a baby works on is their neck muscles. And so if we imagine that Soren was on a boat and the waves were rocking us back and forth, his head goes floppy, floppy, floppy all over. And your neck is strong. Your neck and my neck are strong enough to, to stay up. You know, his faith is like that too. He is cute as a button and God loves him because he was baptized but his faith is not so strong in its knowledge. Soren doesn't know about Abraham or Moses or David or Ezekiel or even the disciples, but I bet you know some of those people. That's what the Bible talks about with faith. It talks about the baby version of faith and the mature version of faith, and Soren can grow his muscles and he can grow his faith too. Here's what the Bible says about it. It says, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by people and the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow. In every respect, we will grow up to become the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Just like baby Soren, his body can grow up to become strong, your faith can grow up to be strong. You don't need to eat milk like Soren does and exercise your neck muscles to make your faith strong. We need to speak the truth to one another in love. We grow our faith so we become strong and mature by talking about God's word together and telling each other the truth. Let's say a prayer about that. Ready to pray, Soren? Dear Jesus, thank you for making us strong. Help us keep on reading your word. Amen. Here's a question for you to talk about before we go. You can talk about this. What person or what part from the Bible do you want to know more about? Soren's ready to go. I'll see you next week. For our scripture review this morning, we actually have two short passages. <clears throat> First is Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is. It's good and pleasing and a perfect will. And then secondly, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and on to 17. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity <clears throat> excuse me, in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. 
From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you this morning as a group of believers, part of your family and part of your body here on earth, of which you are the head. We join with others in our community this morning who are also meeting to worship you as the sovereign God who is working all things together for good for those who love you. And we confess, Lord, we don't always understand what you are doing or why, but Lord, help us to trust you that what you say in your word is true and that you will fulfill the promises you have made according to your wisdom and your timing. We thank you for Lillian's recovery and the progress she's making in rehab. We pray for healing and complete restoration of health for her. We also thank you for your presence with the Castor family, as Gary has already prayed this morning, and walking with them on this very difficult path. We ask that you will continue to embrace them in your strong, protective arms. Enable them, Lord, to rest in your love for them. In the midst of the feelings of anguish and uncertainty, meet them where they are and grant them the strength they need for each day and each hour of that day. We pray for those we support who are serving in organizations dedicated to the furthering of your kingdom. For Elizabeth Enns with the Hope Pregnancy Center here in town, Grant her and her volunteers godly wisdom and sensitivity as they provide information and support to the young women and their partners who seek their help. We pray also this morning for Andy Cornell and the Renewal Fellowship, particularly this week as the General Assembly and the, the uh, Presbyterian Church of Canada meet. May they have opportunities to speak your truth effectively with gentleness, patience, and love that will reflect the grace of our Lord Jesus to the assembly. And for the assembly itself, we pray, O oh God, that your spirit would work mightily in directing the conversations, the discussions, and ultimately the decisions that we made this coming week. We pray that your will may be done as it is in heaven. We also thank you, Lord, for your work of grace here at St. Andrew's among us in restoring unity and building us up by the spirit through the bond of peace and deepening our love for you, for one another here, and for our brothers and sisters in Christ in our community. And now as we listen to you speak to us through Pastor Gary, Lord, teach us your truth and how to respond to those in the community and the world around us, and even in our denomination. Uh, for those who have chosen to follow after the wisdom of this world rather than the wisdom of you, our eternal God. Your truth, your truth, Lord, is as rock solid as the Canadian shield that is so prevalent all around us and can be trusted when all else fails. So then grant us ears, Lord, to hear and hearts to obey what you have to say to us this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. spend eternity together, so stand up and greet one another in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
You know when you're a, when you're a kid and you are, are going to school and you have uh, that terrible nightmare that you forgot your homework or you can't find your locker? Do you remember? Does anybody remember those days? Yeah. I have one as a pastor, and that is that uh, I come to church and my computer doesn't work. And uh, it's not working very well. <laughs> but we're going to journey. <laughs> I didn't hear that, huh? Maybe it's not the computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's probably closer to the truth. This morning we're going to be talking about, uh, about truth and reality. Uh, and the role that they play in this, this cultural war that's taking place in our society today. Truth and reality. We're going to spend a little time talking about the madness of the world right now. Uh, I want to declare up front my bias and I'm going to share a little bit of what, what that is. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the religion of secular humanism and how secular humanism is one of the main ideologies that Satan is using uh, in this cultural war. Uh, talk about what I believe God would have us do in response to that. And uh, talk about uh, something called the die doctrine of secular humanism and describe what equity is and why it's problematic as a foundational pursuit uh, for Christians. And then look at a little story that's, uh, that Jesus uh, shows us uh, in Scripture. Uh, uh, but I want to preface what I'm going to say with, with three, three passages of Scripture. So listen to these because they're, they're kind of foundational for uh, where I was journeying this week in preparation for my sermon. Uh, I found myself in a little bit of a, a landmine, or a, a minefield. I didn't step on a landmine, but I sure was in the middle of it. Um, uh, three scriptures. Think on these scriptures as I'm speaking to you this morning. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, There is a way that seems right, but the end leads only to death. And then I got stuck in a passage in Proverbs from the wisdom of Solomon. It talks about a situation in his lifetime that's very familiar, I believe, to us. And it talks about God's position toward that, God's attitude toward that. It's from Proverbs uh, chapter 6, beginning to read at verse 12. Solomon writes, a troublemaker and a villain who goes about with a corrupt mouth, who winks maliciously with his eye, signals with his feet, and motions with his fingers, who plots evil with deceit in his heart. He always stirs up conflict. Therefore, disaster will overtake him. In an instant, he will suddenly be destroyed without Remedy. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to Him. Haughty eyes. When you read that word or listen to that word, I hear in the middle of that egotistical and self centeredness personality. The psychotic dark triad of personality disorders, narcissism, and Machiavellianism, and Psychopathy. God hates. He hates a lying tongue, deceitfulness, hands that shed innocent blood, moral depravity, a heart that desire, devises 
wicked schemes, like the practice of sexual mutilation of children on the basis of a wicked, wicked ideology of gender-affirming care in response to gender dysphoria. Feet that are quick to rush to evil, deviance, depravity, and promiscuity. A false witness who pours out lies, ideological indoctrination of our children. And a person who stirs up conflict in the community, divisiveness, discord, and deconstruction. I want to start with my bias on this cultural war. Here are some things that I hold to be true, irrevocable and not up for discussion. First one is that reality is real. There is such a thing as reality. Uh, biology is a real thing. A man can't become a woman and just by declaring that they identify as a woman, be a woman. Uh, they can be affirmed legally by a culture, but they can't physiologically transform into another entity simply by saying, I self-identify that way. Uh, psychosis is a real thing. Uh, there is such a thing as a psychological epidemic. The presence transgender issue as is a psychological epidemic brought on by a gender dysphoria that was given life by a culturally legislated policy of gender affirmation. And we as Christians, we are called to speak truth uh, into the world. Truth spoken in love is our response. When you speak truth in love, you are like the little kid in the story, the emperor has new clothes. Does anybody remember that story? It's the story of uh, an emperor who is deceived to think that someone is making him clothes, but they aren't. And he parades around naked to the world, but everybody in the world affirms what he believes he is, dressed in beautiful clothing, clothing not clothery, clothing. And a little child steps forward with the truth. He doesn't have any clothes on. That's what happens when we are called by God to speak truth in love to some of the crazy things that are being conveyed as truth. Because there is ultimate truth. Facts don't care about your feelings. Facts are truth. Uh, and Jesus said, it's interesting that Jesus said, I am the way, I am the life, and I am the what? I am the truth. So when we go to scripture and seek answers to some of the big questions culturally that exist today, we find them in what Jesus said, what he modeled, and what he teaches to us. Sin and evil are real things. Time and space and existence our real things. Um, and we are called to proclaim them as truth in response to what's going on in the world today. The other thing that we're called to do is remain faithful to the great commandment of Christ in his teachings. That should be the lens through which we communicate what we have discerned to be true from Christ. What does the great commandment call us to do? Love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and what? Our neighbor as ourself. Our neighbor as ourself. So when we are observing or speaking into a situation that may trouble us and tempt us to come down hard and judgmentally toward, we're called not to do that, but to speak truth and love to that situation truth. You see, evil also exists, and the calling of God's people is to resist evil in the world. 
in a world called gone, world gone mad, we are called by God to be the adult in the room. The adult in the room, speaking truth to what we observe around us, especially in this cultural war that's taking place. So, so what's going on in this war? Well, I got into the minefield of the cultural battles that are taking place. I want to share a few of them with you, but, but before I share them, I want to say something specific to you. I'm going to be talking about the LGBTQ community and share some stories that are raging in the social media world that relate to culture support of a June uh, Gay Pride Month in the West. Because I'm sharing what I believe to be true with you does not make me homophobic or transphobic or biphobic or any phobic you want to conjure up. Phobic means fear. I don't fear these people. I don't fear the LGBTQ community. I'm called to love them as I love myself. That's what I'm called to do. But I'm also called to speak truth uh, into it. Nor am I trying to speak truth as an intention to promote hatred toward this community. I want to share the truth of what is going on and invite you to decide if culture's promotion of these ideas, doctrines, and propositions are first of all admirable and true, second, are, do they make common sense, third, are they affirmed by God, and fourth, are they values that we Christians should affirm also. Later in my sermon I hope to, to show you and get you to understand and believe that sharing the truth that I'm sharing this morning is intense, not as an act of oppression or discrimination or hate speech. It's an intent as an expression of love for my neighbor as myself, which is the paramount commandment that we're called to as believers. Uh, let me be clear. I believe that God loves and cares for the LGBTQ community as much as he loves and cares for St. Andrews. And he calls us as his people, as his children, to love in the same manner as we have been loved by God. Uh, but I do hold to an orthodox position that God hates sin and loves the sin. Uh, and we are to speak that truth and love toward all who are trapped in sin by their lives, not just the LGBTQ community. So one of the things we're going to have to talk about today is sin, and how Christ saw sin, and how Christ responded to sin. Because we believe that sin, we believe this about sin, that in the manner that Christ taught, and in the manner that Christ lived, and the manner he responded to it, he's calling his children to do the same thing. Uh, I really believe that God wants us to use that model as the way we live out our orthodoxy in our lives as a family of believing Christians. Clear? Okay, let's jump in. Here are some stories that I've been wrestling with this week. Uh, I want you to be thinking about four questions as I share some of this stuff with you. Um, are the ideas, doctrines, and propositions in these news reports, are they promoting truth and reality? Second, do they, do they make sense? Third, do you think that God affirms them? Fourth, are the ideas, doctrines, propositions, and values that I'm going to talk about, are they things that we should affirm as Christians? I'll start with a kind of a humorous one. The Ford Motor Company this week, in honor of the June uh, Pride Month, uh, has started making a gay truck. Did you know that trucks can be gay? Uh, it's being marketed. 
Um, here's, the, here's the announcement from Ford in a news item. Ford will continue de demonstrating its allyship with the L LGBTQ community at the Goodwood Festival of Speed this week, bringing very gay Raptor, the next generation Ford Ranger Raptor, along for a ride. How well seated in truth is that? Um, can a truck have a gender? And can it be gay? Is that a real thing? Uh, how well seated in reality is that idea that non-animate objects have genders? I got stuck in another one. Uh, it's the Bud Light marketing campaign. Has anyone heard of this? There's a, a young man named Dylan Mulvaney. He's a transgender influencer, and he was hired by Bud Light to promote their beer. Um, he has he has 10 million followers who follow his every word uh, and take his direction and listen to what he would have them do. He recently made an announcement. And the announcement was this, and this is verbatim from his lips, uh, sent out to his followers. I recently told my parents, recently, that I may be a little bit romantically interested in women. And that was a big shock to them, considering the past 10 years coming out as gay, then queer, then non-binary, then trans. And I think it was a bit, uh, just a bit of a shock. So I tell my dad, and he, oh, I would love to see you get a woman pregnant. And I said, oh, no, no. She would be getting me pregnant. And then he said, what, do you have a vagina now? And I said, never say never. And then I tell my mom, and she goes, I would just love to see you have our own property one day. And in California, that sort of, you know, uh, parents dream. It's not having kids or getting married. It's if you own, uh, you're able to own a house. And wouldn't that be nice? When you hear that, does that make any sense at all? Can a man impregnate a woman? Can a man who does not have the biological parts to conceive and give birth do that simply by fast uh, fantasizing, never say never. Is there anything a little bit nonsensical about that? How, how do 10 million impressionable youth hear this ulterior universe story? We live in an age of the emperor has no clothes. Here's a third example, Target. Everybody know Target, the department store? In the US, they started a new line of clothing called the Pride Collection. In this collection, there is a line of gender-affirming clothing for transgender children. The program developer, a transgender designer named Eric Carnell, a self-declared Satanist, uh, and one of the product development people for Target, uh, created the products that they sell. Here are some of the products that they're selling. Uh, undergarments that conceal genital parts that do not conform to the self-identity of the child. It also includes accessory pins like uh, Satan respects pronouns and t-shirts that celebrate gender affirmation. Is that a good thing for kids to be promoted? Uh, is it something that we should get behind? There's a new slogan. Go woke, go broke. Has anybody heard that recently? Uh, it's circulating in society. It basically promotes the view that if a corporation promotes the ideal, ideology of wokeness, people who oppose that ideology shouldn't buy their products. Now, a picture with the Toronto Blue Jays just got caught up in this mess. 
Anthony Bass. Anybody know that name? Anybody watch baseball other than me? Yeah. Uh, he reposted a video that said just that. That if uh, a corporation is using their, their platform to promote an ideology that you disagree with, you probably shouldn't per support their corporation. Uh, and he was vilified for that position, speaking that truth to that topic. The last night that he pitched at the, at the uh, Sky Dome, is it still called Sky Dome? Yeah. Or the, uh, the Rogers Center. Am I right with that? Doesn't matter. When he came out to pitch, the whole stadium booed him off the field almost. Because he had stood up and said, I don't think this is right. Um, what does that crowd response to Bast say about the cultural values of our times? Is that the type of culture that we want to support? Uh, one final thing, and this is really... There's a group called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence who've been invited as honored guests to the uh, LA Dodgers Pride Night at Dodger Stadium for the June 16th game against the Giants. Uh, the group has uh, sparked complaints of being anti-Catholic. And it's mostly complied, uh, comprised of male and male identifying people who dress as nuns. And there are those who believe it is mocking Catholicism, although the group says of itself, uh, it uses humor and irre uh, irreverent wit to expose, expose the forces of bigotry. Uh, the group is slated to receive the Community Hero Award uh, at Dodger Stadium on Pride Night. Now a Catholic uh, pitcher, Clay uh, Kershaw, has spoken out against the group and, and is under attack for declaring the truth that their ideology is offensive. Uh, not something to be affirmed, let alone awarded. Are the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence the heroes that we want for our children? Uh, there is a culture war going on, folks. It's ideologically driven. It seeks to replace the Judeo-Christian ethic and the moral code with the religion of secular humanism. It's a paradigm shift in human history, and the church needs to wake up because it is primarily focused on the hearts and minds of our children and our grandchildren. How did we ever get here? And more importantly, what are we going to do about it? And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Um, I appreciated Pastor Len's sermon last week. He set the table very well for what I'm going to say this morning, part of what I'm going to say this morning. Uh, he painted a beautiful image of what it is and what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and how we are to report ourselves toward other people. He called you all a bunch of cracked pots. Anybody catch that? Pretty brave. But it's also pretty true. We are indeed cracked, cracked pots. The imagery uh, that uh, Len gave to us is that we are all cracked pots. We are all flawed. We have been forged in the fire by the hands of God. The thumbprint of God is on our lives. He is the potter and we are the clay. He is trying to form us into something good, to perform a good purpose in the world. We are here to shine the light of his love into the darkness of the world that I just described to you. Into these temporal and flawed shells, these jars of clay, God has placed his spirit, the light of the world. The light of God is in these earthly vessels 
It has power to release those who are trapped in darkness. It has deliverance for those who are rooting around in the evil of the devil uh, that is pervasive in this world. We are be to be the instrument, the vessel of God's grace to the world. We are to let the light of the truth of Christ shine out through our lives, through the cracks and the pores of our cracked pots. Light flooding out from the Spirit living within us. Light into darkness. Light into darkness. So we hold the tension in our hearts of the goodness of the things we know and believe about God, these treasures and jars of clay, and the good things He wants to see and to do with our lives. We hold those things in tension with the madness of the culture and this dark age in which we are living out our temporal existence. The magnificence of the existence of Christ in us needs to burst forth, burst forth into this world. And when we let God do that through our lives, we pray that we will release the light of truth spoken in love into some of these dark situations and that the light will overcome the darkness because God's word says that it will. Light will overcome the darkness. That's primarily what we should be doing in response to some of this craziness in the world. Let the light out. Expose the truth, hold to the truth, declare the truth, live the truth. Because untruth is at the heart of the message of the religion of secular humanism. Because secular humanism is declaring an untruth as to the way and the truth and the life. But as King Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 14, he said, there is a way that seems right. But it leads to death. It leads to death. Um, what is the way that Solomon's talking about? Well, it's, it's culture's religion of secular humanism, established by Satan in the Garden of Eden. There was an old book written back in the 80s, I don't know if any of you read it, it was called Satan is alive and well and living on planet Earth. Uh, Satan is alive and well and living on planet Earth in 2023. And his way of operating is quite an ingenious way. It goes something like this. For everything good that God ordains as good and gives to his children, Satan has a counterfeit that is as equally not good for us. And his counterfeit is intent on sowing division and confusion in life that will ultimately result in the separation of mankind from a right relationship with God. It's a strategy of deceit and division and destruction it sounds right, but in the end it leads to death. Satan takes what God has said about how we are to live our lives in relationship with other people and him and twists it just a little bit and turns it on its head to be a plausible lie, but it is still a lie. It sounds enticing, enticingly true, but it's a lie leading to destruction. Let me, let me give you an example of that. I'll give you two. God says, I am love, and those who abide in me abide in love, and I abide in them. Because of this, we are commanded to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbor as ourselves. We hold that to be true. And the devil takes that and he twists it in just a touch. And he says, God is love, and love is good. 
Then who you love is up to you as long as you love. There are no boundaries around love. But the truth is, there are boundaries. There is right. There is wrong. There are guidelines for how our love is expressed to other people in an intimate way. But his truth sounds so appealing. There are no boundaries. Express yourself in any way you desire. Another example is God says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made in my image. Man and woman, I have created you in a binary relationship. Satan takes that and he turns it and he twists it and he says, yeah, you're fearfully and wonderfully, wonderfully able to be whoever you want to be or identify as. Gender is what you feel you are regardless of reality or biology. It is a social construct not a biological binary reality. And the truth is, sex and gender are binary. <coughs> They're based on science, science and biology and God's word and based on the foundation of truth and reality and common sense. And when we move on to embrace that type of ideology, we lose our bearings with God. Satan takes what God has said about how we are to live our lives and twists it just a little bit and turns it on its head and turns it into a plausible lie, but it's still a lie. Uh, for everything that God has ordained good, Satan has a counterfeit. I got a lot here and I'm running out of time. I want to end with a story. Um, because what we're trying to seek out here is how do we actually speak truth and love to people who are caught in sin? Uh, how do we be Christ in that situation? Well, let's look at how Christ responded to that. Uh, if you turn over to John chapter 8, there's a little story about, from Jesus' life that gives us an example of what the church should be doing in response to those who are caught in sin. It goes like this. John chapter 8. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought to Jesus a woman caught in adultery. Now this is what the story is about, but I think you can find, we can all find our place in this story. Why? Because we all sin. We are all sinners. So to place yourself in that story, maybe let's just change what the reason that the person was brought to Jesus. Maybe it's something that you're struggling with. Because we all have things in our lives that displease God. And that's what sin is. It's displeasing God and missing the mark of your life with Him. That sin could be anything. It could be alcoholism. It could be promiscuity. It could be theft. It could be, you name a sin. Put yourself in the picture. You've been caught and dragged before Jesus as an authority. And the teacher said to him, you know, Jesus, it says, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And in the law of Moses, we are commanded to stone her. Now, what do you say we should do? We don't know. What the full circumstances of her life were. 
We don't know whether she was in prostitution, whether it was an affair. We don't know any of the details. All we know is that she has been accused and attacked by this religious mob and dragged before Jesus. And the attitude that they have is, we're told we should stone her to death. How would you like to be in that situation, standing there with the crowd of accusers? How did Jesus respond to that sin? How did he respond to the law? Well, I would declare to you he responded with grace. I would declare to you that he responded with love for his neighbor as himself. You see, we are not called to judgment in the face of sin. We are called to speak truth and love towards sin. But we are called more than that to work at getting to being people of the great commandments before we turn into judges over cultural issues. We are called to follow the right way, which is the way of reality, to walk in the light, which is found in Jesus. We are called to leave judgment to God. We are called not to be polluted by the world system. We are called to protect the innocent. We are to care for others, especially our enemies. We are called to let the light shine out of our crackpot lives. We are called to love. And so he, he began to write down in the ground. He bent down and he wrote. We don't know what he wrote. And they kept questioning him. What are you going to do, Jesus? What should we do with this person? It says we should stone her. And one by one, they became silenced. And he straightened up and he looked at them and he said this to them. Let any one of you who is without sin Stop and sit there for a second. That any one of you who is without sin pick up the first stone. And then he began to write again in the sand. And at that, those who had began by accusing one by one got up and began to walk away. The older ones first, the notes. Maybe they had the most baggage. Until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and he asked her, Woman, where are the people who condemned you? Isn't there anybody left? Did anybody pick up a stone? Did anybody throw it at you? And she said, no, nobody did. And then, he says the most amazing thing Neither do I condemn. Neither do I condemn. You know, even for Jesus, judgment and retribution were not in his hands. They were in his Father's hands. And I'm not saying to you that there isn't going to be a day of accountability. There is going to be a day of accountability. We are all, as sinners, going to stand before the mercy seat of Christ. Before the judgment seat of God. And give an account for our lives. We are going to do that. 
But our role is not to take on that role of judgment. Our role is to take on the mercy side of Christ. Grace. Neither do I condemn you. But he doesn't stop there. And here's where truth and love wins out. He says, go and leave your life of sin. Leave your life of sin. And that's the posture of the church, I believe. We are called to love. But if we really love, we will declare truth to you. We will declare truth to you. But we will leave judgment to God. I think that's really countercultural. But that's what Christ calls us to. Let's pray. Father God, it's a, it's a minefield. Help us to keep our hearts focused on the priorities of your demands on our life. Let's focus on them, God. Help us to understand that, that there is one great commandment that is irrevocable and not to be disobeyed. And that is to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, and love our neighbor as ourselves. Full stop. Your word says, all of the law and all of the prophets and everything that has been written in your word stands on that one commandment. So I pray, God, that we would be a people of grace who live out our lives with that commandment at the center of who we are as your followers. We are people who love you and love others as ourselves. And we leave the sorting out of all the other issues to you. But with our lives, we speak truth into our culture. Amen. Let us stand and sing together. Thy word.
from here and walk in the light. And be the light of Christ to others.